as I said, the slides always begin with these two things. We're now on module two, we're on decision trees. Um, and we'll try and wrap up in about an hour and 15 minutes here. So we talked about decision trees. We're gonna have both a mix of a, a lectures and labs. We're gonna talk about the structure of decision trees. We're gonna talk about concepts of information gain, uh, which is Shannon entropy and the Gini index, which is critical to understanding how, how decision trees work. We'll talk a little bit about future selection. And then we'll show how you can use decision trees to classify things. In this case, we're going to try classifying flowers. But you can use the same concepts and codes to classify just about anything. So we have to remember that there are differences between clustering and classification. So clustering is something we do with principal component analysis or hierarchical clustering. It's what we do when we you know, match socks from the laundry. Um, the object classes don't necessarily are not defined or labeled. We're just trying to look for, for things that are logically similar. But with classification, we're trying to do something a little more sophisticated. We already have labels about what things are supposed to be. So these are the healthy ones. These are the control ones. These are the diseased ones. These are um, you know, in terms of flowers. These are virginica or versicolor, sotisosa. So clustering is different in classification. And in many cases, supervised machine learning uses. Um, for you are not sharing your screen, just a heads I'm not. up. Oh, OK. Let me make sure I've done this correctly. Is that now sharing? Um, yes, now we can see. Yeah, now we can see your screen. OK, sorry about that. Um, probably didn't click it strong enough. So anyways, it's now up. Can everyone see the screen and slides now? So I'll just show this the objectives again about what we're trying to do. We're looking at decision trees, talk about Gini index, we'll do flower classification of irises, and we'll look at the code. So we've saw this image before, but we'll have labeled data. One is labeled red, one is labeled blue. We run our classifier and it now separates them. And that can be done through uh, partial least squares discriminant analysis. It could be done through partial uh, um, principal component analysis. It could be done through a support vector machine, or it could be done through a decision tree. Any one of those things are classifiers that allows us to pull or separate these things based on certain features. So we've seen this before. This is the same slide we talked about with decision trees. And I showed the example of uh, survivorship on the Titanic, how the data analysis showed that women and children in indeed were chosen first. But there are certain choices about the age and the size of families in terms of their likelihood of surviving. It is uh, decision trees are supervised learning. You can do them to classify things. You can use them to, to perform regression. Um, the lines or the branches are called edges. And then the, the boxes are called nodes. So it's really a flow chart in some respects. Um, and we have tests that are performed uh, in each of the nodes or boxes. Um, and then these boxes show branches about the decision or the outcome of those tests or um, evaluations. And then we can choose certain paths through the decision tree to identify or determine um, a particular group or a particular class based on these one, two, or three decisions. And so the depth of the tree is essentially the number of decisions you have to make to get to a final terminal node or terminal grouping. So you can have a classification tree, which is how to classify survivors and non-survivors in Titanic, um, or regression trees, which sort of predict um, specific numbers uh, called um, continuous um, numeric data. Um, decision trees are formally called in the computing world carts or classification and regression trees because they can do both. 
So when you create a decision tree, try and decide which features are most important and which conditions you should be using to decide things on. So in the case of Titanic, we decided that, you know, and the performance of decision tree, or maybe what was done, women and children first. So women first, so that was one decision tree. Um, of the ones who weren't women, how did you decide next? So it was among children, and then among children, it was based on the number of individuals in a family. So in this case, is sex male or female? Um, that was a decision rule. Is age greater than nine and a half? That's a decision rule. Are there a number of siblings and spouses? Is there more than two and a half? And then that's a decision rule. And then the green and red are the decisions. So if, if you were not male, you survived. If your age was more than nine and a half, you likely died. If you're younger than nine and a half and you had fewer um, uh, or more siblings, you likely survived. Um, the edges are those uh, lines, and those are the paths that you take. And so we can go from the top one, and in some cases, if you survive, that's a terminal node. Um, but then you can go to other nodes or layers, layer one, layer two, layer three, um, or layer four to decide or determine who lived and who died. The top node is the root node. Uh, that in this case is the collection of all passengers in the Titanic. The splitting is the decision, you know, are you greater than nine and a half or less than nine and a half? Are you male or female? Um, so we split things. Um, those are decided through a decision node. And then when you can't decide anymore because, you know, uh, everything had been falls into that one node, that's called a terminal node. But if you still have other things still that allow you to decide, so if you were female, um, that was the terminal node. If you were not female, then it was a decision of, are you a young male or an older male? And how many people in your family? Those were child nodes in that decision tree. So decision trees are pretty simple to understand. There's not complicated math. We use decision trees every day, whether it's a matter of taking a, uh, a path home from work when we drive or walk, um, whether it's a matter of deciding what to do um, with a um, set of scientific experiments or assessing how we're going to choose passengers to go into lifeboats. Those are decision trees. Um, it's considered a white box, not a black box, because we can see the method of decision. We can work with numerical data because we're deciding, you know, male, female, um, or categ that's categorical data, or age, nine and a half or above or less, that's numerical. Uh, we don't have to do any um, scaling or normalization. We didn't have to do it for the example with the Titanic. Uh, it models how we think. Um, we don't need statistical fixes. The disadvantage of decision trees is that they're not the most robust machine learning method. They can be susceptible to small changes in the training set, although there's some fixes called bagging and boosting that do this. There's a tendency to overfit. It uses what's called a greedy algorithm. And so that can lead you to sort of dead ends. The random forest approach of using multiple trees actually fixes that. And then there's sometimes inherent bias, uh, depending on how many categorical levels you use. So you can choose to just use one level when, say, show that you know male-female choice was it. But to get the full perspective about age and family size in the case of Titanic data set, that is you know up to you in terms of what number of categories or layers you wanted to have. So there are human choices and human biases that can happen in decision trees. But for the most part, because of developments like bagging, boosting, and random forest, decision trees can perform as well as some of the very best um, uh, and most advanced machine learning methods. So it's a good one to know. So how do you learn a decision tree? So there are two routes. One is called recursive binary splitting or iterative dichotomization. So it's a mouthful, so we just say RBS and ID3. And what they're doing is they look at the data and they 
assess different splitting points. So in the case of, do you choose age nine and a half or do you choose age 10 or age nine or age 22? That choice of nine and a half um, was something that had to be assessed by looking at different splitting points by IBS, RBS or ID3. Now the choice between male and female, that's categorical. So that's not so hard to choose. So you can have categorical or numerical points. And when it's a numerical one, RBS and ID3 are important. What you're looking for in terms of why did they choose nine and a half or sibling um, family size of two and a half, that was because they assessed the information gain um, or IG in terms of what was the best splitting point. Um, now, if we have, you know, three features, three categories, there can be three candidate splits. But if we're talking about age, um, you know, going from one to 100 and choosing half year intervals, now we've got 200 candidate splits. So that's a little harder to choose. Um, and if you're looking at many split options, then you need to be able to calculate the cost of those splits pretty quickly and to identify the one that has the highest information gain. Ultimately, the one that has the highest information gain, whether it's a categorical or numerical split, is the one that becomes the root node. So information gain is something that's been around for probably about 100 years, and it's the idea of entropy. And entropy universally can be calculated with the formula here, which is probability of, of being in a state or a class, a PI. Um, and it's that probability times the log two of that probability. And you sum it over all of these classes or states. Um, so entropy is a way of people have used this for calculating and you know, weighting the probability of certain um, bases showing up in a sequence. And you can get these graphical plots to show the size of the letter, which is an indication of its entropy or information gain. So what you can do is assess um, the relative gain for a feature by its entropy calculation relative to the entropy for the entire data set. And what you need to do is then calculate the maximum inf information gain for a given class to decide which one is going to be your root node and where you're going to do your splitting um, if you need to do the splitting in both the root nodes and the other decision nodes. So with entropy, all of the probabilities um, are fractional. They're all less than or equal to one. Um, you notice that the entropy equation uh, has a negative sign in front of it. And in the case of simple two classes, um, you know, male, female, yes, no sort of thing, the maximum entropy you can calculate with the formula. It's a sum over two states, two classes, probabilities, one and a half, one over two each, um, two different states. So the entropy becomes one. You can do the calculation for four classes, that becomes an, an entropy of two, eight classes is three, and so on. So we can look at one now, we're just looking at categories, we're not looking at numbers, and we're looking at um, buying a car, a used car, basically. So um, this is sort of an intuitive one, but we're trying to calculate what is the best rule for buying a car? Should you choose its age as a decision? Is it you know, a new car, an older car? Um, the mileage, again, we're talking about used cars. So high mileage, low mileage, or if it's road tested, which means did you take it on the, uh, a drive and see how well it performed? So these are the tests that we're performing, uh, decisions that we're making. And then the, the, the final result is, did we buy the car? And um, just from this table, you can see that um, there's one set of rules, namely road testing, where there's a perfect correlation. So if you road tested it, um, you bought it. If you didn't road test it, you don't buy it or you are recommended not to buy. 
On the other hand, if we look at mileage, there isn't a really good correlation. So in some cases we buy a low mileage one, and in some cases we don't buy a, a, a low mileage one. In other cases, um, low mileage ones are not bought, high mileage ones are not bought. So relatively poor correlation. In terms of the age of the car, you can kind of see that if it's a newer car, there's a tendency to buy, but there's also situations where a newer car we didn't buy or were told not to buy. So the one that has the highest correlation with our result is probably the one that has the highest information gain. The one that has the poorest correlation with our result probably has the lowest information gain. So that's just a high over high level view. But let's do some math. So this is simple enough that you could intuitively see it with your eyes, but we can do it mathematically. So we can take our, our information gain for the entire system. Um, and in this case, the system is buy or don't buy. And so there's four cases. And so um, we can calculate the probability of purchasing, um, which is um, total count of ones that we want to buy over the total number of examples. So total number of examples is four, total count of buy is two, total count of don't buy is also two. So we can put in, you know, P of buy, log two P of buy, P of don't buy, and log two of P don't buy. Calculate those numbers. Then we get 0.5 times log two of 0.5 plus 0.5 times log two of 0.5. And we calculated a total entropy for the system of one. Okay, so that's the system entropy. Now we wanna find which of the different tests from age to mileage to road testing is most informative. So let's look at recent versus old. Do we choose recent cars to buy or old cars to buy? So if we look at the list, there are two instances of recent where we bought and one instance of recent where we didn't buy. And then there's another case of uh, one instance of don't buy where it's old, but zero instances of where we say it's old and we say don't buy. So these are labels, and then we can calculate the entropy um, of this information of consistent of age. So um, the entropy of recent um, has, you know, it's a pretty good guess. And so it gets an entropy score of 0.9. Uh, in terms of using information about old, it didn't really tell us a whole lot. So it gets a, a value of zero. I'm showing the calculation of how you get 0.918 uh, with log twos and probabilities for the p's. And, um, the numbers are calculated. And the E old, we also get to zero. So we can now calculate the information gain that we get from age versus buy. So the parent one was the system, buy, don't buy. Um, and then the children uh, is the system for age. So we can take the weighted average of the children, remember the point of 0.918, and then the 0, 0.0. So three quarters of them were relevant to the recent one, one quarter were relevant to old. So the weighted average is three quarters plus the entropy for recent, or times, the and then one quarter times the entropy for old. So we get a weighted average of 0.688. The entropy of the system of buy, don't buy was one. So it's one minus 0.688. So we get, um, um, information gain of using age of 0.312 or 3112. Ideally, we'd like an information gain that's one because um, that's the most informative, but at least age, it tells us something. We can do the same calculation for mileage. So that's highlighted there. There's low and high mileage cars. Some cases when it was low, we said buy, and in some cases when it was high, we said don't buy. So we can do the same calculation uh, where we're calculating the entropy for the children. And so the entropy for the children in low and high is a case of one for the low, and the entropy for high in the children is one. 
I'm just showing the calculations below that. So if we take the entropy for the parent, which is buy, don't buy, minus the information gain for low and high mileage, we get one minus one. So the information gain for mileage is zero. In other words, there's no information in terms of using mileage to decide whether to buy or don't buy a car. Whereas with age, we got a score of 0.3112. So yeah, there's information that you can use age to decide. Now let's go to the last one about road tested. And I highlighted this before is that uh, the road testing correlated really well with whether to buy or not to buy. And so the entropy for yes with road testing is zero. And the entropy with no road testing is also zero. So if you take the entropy for the parent, which is one, minus the entropy, the average entropy for the children, uh, which is 0.5 times zero plus 0.5 times zero, which is zero, we get an information gain of one minus zero, which is one. So road testing has the most information gain. It's one. Mileage has the least. It's zero. Age is intermediate. It's about 0.3112. And so that's just indicated here. So we did the math and we found out that road testing has the maximum information gain. So road testing should be your root node. Age shouldn't be your root node and mileage definitely shouldn't be your root node. And in fact, by just using this yes, no for road testing, you actually reach the terminal point because it's, you don't need any more information with this data set. It's say, if it's road tested, buy it. If it's not road tested, don't buy it. So the maximum information, road test. So this is the root node, the decision, road testing. Yes, it produces two terminal nodes. That's the end of your decision tree. It's a two layer decision tree. The depth is two. Does that make sense for everyone? There is a question questions? in the Slack. Um, what was the entropy of parent and children for age? So age, I guess we'll just go back. Um, so the parent, um, again, was buy, don't buy. So that's one. That was, we determined that one. The children is the weighted average of both the uh, recent, which has an entropy of 0.91, and for old, which had an entropy of zero, and the weighted average was 0 0.3, 0 0.75 times 0 0.9 plus 0 0.25 times zero. So that gives a total average of 0.688. And so the information gain is parent minus children, so one minus 0 0.688 to give you 0 0.3. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, I mean, we went through the math, it's fairly detailed, um, but it was also, I sort of highlighted at the beginning, it, it was intuitive. You guys would have been able to see that road testing was the most informative decision in terms of whether to buy or don't buy. So entropy is a great way of doing it, but there's also another way, which is called the Gini index. Um, and what's nice about the Gini index is that because you're not having to do logs, it's just squares, um, it's a faster calculation. Now, the interesting thing is that it's the, the rating is opposite. So high information gain, a high IG is good. A low Gini index is good. So just like entropy, it sort of you know, ranges between zero and one or zero and two. Gini, it's always between zero and one. Like information gain or Shannon, entropy, there's a PI, and PI is the probability of being in the class. Um, so we've just got Ps. We have a, a one minus, in this case, the sum of these P squareds uh, across different ones. So this is an alternative to information gain. And the point is that GI, a low GI is go good. Whereas an information gain, a high IG is good. Um, so this is how a lot of this feature selection is done in decision trees, how split points are decided. 
uh, and as I said, the ones with the highest information gain or the lowest Gini index are the ones that usually serve as the root or the, if it's not the best node, then it might be the second best node and then the third best node. And so this choice of which feature, whether it was age or uh, road testing or um, mileage, those were all um, features that we were choosing. So road testing was the best feature. Um, age was the next best feature. Mileage is a useless feature because it had no information gain. It had a high uh, Gini index. And so this is where feature selection inherently is built into uh, decision trees. And it's also a way of what we call pruning decision trees so that you don't have to have as many nodes. This is just a plot of how the Gini index in blue and how entropy in green look. And they're ranking the impurity index. It's just a graph to say that the Gini index and entropy or information gain are very similar mathematically, like the blue line and the light green line almost perfectly overlap. So, so mathematically, they're almost the same or equivalent. So if you're wondering why, you know, I'm saying they're the same, mathematically they are, it's just that it's, it's in the opposite direction. So the choice based on information gain allows you to select features, which is a form of feature selection, which is also called tree pruning. And when you tr prune a tree, a decision tree, that actually improves the performance. You're not adding useless information like mileage in your decision tree. In fact, you didn't even have to add um, um, mileage or age to the decision tree, just choosing um, the one piece of information, which was road testing was sufficient and that made our decision tree perfect. And it only had to be two layers. So that was a very well pruned tree. Um, so there's weakest link pruning, reduced error pruning that people will use, but the simplest one, as I said, is just look at your information gain. We had information gain, in this case, for male, uh, female. That was the most information gain. So this one had a 0.73. The information gain in terms of age had a 0.17. And the information gain in terms of siblings and spouses being greater than 2.5 had a, an information gain of 0.05. Um, so the one that had the highest information gain was sex, next age, next was sibling. In the case of our um, car selection, uh, it was um, test driving. That was the highest information gain. We could have kept um, maybe mileage or not mileage, but in terms of age. And then mileage was useless, so it would be crossed out. It had the lowest information gain. So we would have had a, a plot where it probably just would have been road testing, and that was it. So in the case of Titanic, gender, sex, age, and sibling uh, size uh, and spouse um, presence were the most important features. So. Survival was the label, just like buy, don't buy with a car. So we've got yes and no. So we've got male and female, so that's a binary case. We have age, which is uh, a numeric one. And we have uh, sibling size or family size, uh, which is also a numeric feature. So we have some categorical features and numeric features. Now, there are some cases where the data is completely useless. So if we chose the zodiac sign for each person or their month of birth, it probably had nothing to do with whether you survived or not. So sex, age, and, and family size were useful features. Zodiac sign is a useless feature, so we cross that out. Now, this could also be in terms of information gain or Gini index. So the Gini index for male, female is 0.11, age 0.23, sibling size 0.28. The Gini index for code zodiac sign was 0.98, which is useless. Information gain would have just been the reverse. So um, with recursive binary splitting, you could you know, keep on splitting and splitting and splitting. And 
um, with the case of the Titanic, we choose to you know keep on splitting from age to um, you know sex to sibling size, but we could have also chosen you know weight and maybe we had zodiac sign. When do you just stop splitting because there's just no more information? That's called the depth of the tree. So that um, Titanic tree was had a depth of about three or four. Um, in the case of our car buying tree, it had a depth of two. Um, and so you're trying to choose minimize things. You just don't want to keep on splitting when it's useless. Um, so the depth should be a small fraction of the total number of features. So with the car one, we had um, three features. So our depth is two or could call it one. So that's a, a fraction of them. Sometimes you can just choose an arbitrary number and say, I'm only going to have a tree that'll always be no more than depth of three. Um, but you also have to decide what point are you just splitting between, you know, three individuals in Titanic versus, you know, the 1,700 that we're starting out with. Um, so if you cover and explain the survivorship for 90% with a tree of depths of three or four, then there's no point trying. So we're going to try a real example, and we're going to work with one that's commonly used in machine learning. It's called the iris flower one. And it's how do you classify irises based on their floral dimensions? Uh, and first of all, a data set. So you could go out to your garden if you have lots of irises and take a ruler and start measuring. Um, but it turned out there's a data set that was collected by uh, Ronald Fisher, who's a very famous statistician. He's got the Fisher tests that he developed. Um, and he was also a pioneer for linear discriminant analysis. So he collected data. Uh, it was actually collected by a, um, a scientist, a botanist in Quebec that gave the data to Fisher. Um, and they got 50 samples of each. One was for Iris setosa, another one for Virginica, and another one for Versicolor. And I have pictures of the setosa flower, and the Virginica flower, and the Versicolor. And they have different flowers. Um, they have a petal and a sepal. In some cases, the petal is very big, like in Versicolor color. But setosa, uh, the petal is very small. Other cases, the sepal is large, um, but in some cases very large. So you can classify these species of iris, all purple iris, based on the shape and dimensions of their petal, both on their and their sepal and width and length. So this is the data um, collected by Edgar Anderson, given to Robert Fisher. And this is the list of sepal length sepal width, petal length, petal width. And if you just look at the data, you can see that Setosa has very small petals, Virginica has long, wide petals, and Versicolor is sort of in, in between. So you don't need machine learning to do this. Uh, I mean, anyone could do it, just like with the car buying recommendations. But this is sort of the toy color, uh, toy problem set. So we have to take our data and select the features. So we write it out into a table like this. Sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width. Um, and then we indicate species. So if that's our input data, then we can start actually trying to do some Python programming to classify iris flowers. So what you guys can all do right now is go to Colab and open up file uh, to create a Colab uh, notebook. And from there, you can create a new notebook and just go to that on your computers. And you can start changing this untitled notebook, which is Python one, and just call it Iris Decision Tree 4 uh, dot Python. And so at this stage, you can just let you guys start coding. Has everyone finished coding? Anyways, um, probably for most of you, it uh, would be hard to write a decision tree. So what we've done is we've got um, a Python code for you. So the decision tree has actually been written for you and it's in module two. 
So um, maybe what we'll do is just see if people can find that decision tree module. Can everyone find that? Maybe I'll just ask Nia or the TAs and people to let us know why Slack if they're having any difficulty. We've had one thumbs up here, two thumbs up here, indicating that it's um, that they've been able to open the file. I am going to put a poll in the Slack. Yeah, I think it's it's important because this is this is your first effort of both looking at the code, but we're also going to be using this code um, for a little bit of a lab or an exercise. So we want to make sure that everyone's found this. Any okay, so it is, uh, there's a poll in the Slack. Well, maybe wait another minute or so just to make sure that everyone's got it. Usually um, it's a it's a case of, more case, of if, you, if you don't get it or can't seem to open it, this is where we need to maybe have the TAs connect with you or try and answer a question because we just want to make sure that you're in the CBW machine learning. Um, you're able to go to Google Drive, you're able to find module two, um, but also that you've been able to open CoLab and that you're able to. Okay, we've got 13 yes votes and zero no votes. So I'm going to suggest we move on. But if you have issues, if any participants have issues, just unmute yourself or post in the Slack. We'll help you out. Great. Um, within that, you're going to find um, the, the name for the program, um, which is Iris um, Decision Tree 4. And if you open it. I, I think I've not been able to open it, actually. I've not. Okay, Joseph, you, you're not able to open it or you're... So have you been able to find your Google Drive under CBW Machine Learning? So, if, if there's some issues and anyone's having some difficulty, then I, I guess we'd invite them to go to the, um, the room um, with one of the TAs just to make sure that, that things are right. Yes, I am oh. opening up the breakout rooms or I'm, I'm preparing the breakout rooms now. Um, and if anyone's having any issues with finding the, um, the files, they are linked in the Slack. Thank you, Mark. Okay. okay, so if people want to go to Slack and they've had some difficulty trying to find things, then the, the links are there in Slack. All right, so the program, if you open it up and, and start reading, there's a general flow. So it, it reads data, which is typically the first thing you have to have in a program. It checks the data. So that's a good programming practice. Make sure that there's, there's no missing data. Uh, it then creates some of the training and testing data sets. Um, so you've got 150 uh, flowers, 50 of each. You're going to have to choose some of them, which will be training, some of which will be testing. Um, you're also going to have to create a function that decides how to do splitting, because that's the central thing about a decision tree. Do you split? And this is because we're dealing with numeric data. So do you you know, split on the sepal width at this number of centimeters? Do you split on the pedal width and the pedal length? You've got four different dimensions for three different flower types. So we have to have a splitting function. We're going to use the Gini index to calculate um, you know, what's our maximum or minimum um, information gain. Remember that high Gini index is bad and the low Gini index is good. And so we're going to try and choose the cases where which dimension, which flower dimension um, 
is going to give us the lowest Gini index. And from the test splitting, we're going to have something that calculates the best split because it's going to use the Gini index calculation. And then we're going to determine, you know, have we found a, a split that has separated things perfectly? That's called a terminal node function. And then to identify nodes or groups that still need more splitting. And so we'll be recursively, once we've split one group out that's terminal, there's still going to be at least you know, two other groups that need further splitting. Remember, it's three flowers. And we might get a split where we get some flowers grouped together, and we might get a split where one flower group splits out really nicely. OK, so that's the general algorithm. Um, I'd mentioned before that if we were to code this or pretend to code this, we would have to import some mathematical library. So we'd have to get the NumPy library and the Pandas library. Pandas is to read you know, text in CSV files, and NumPy is allowing us to, to handle tables and matrices. So this is the code to read the data in. So we're using the Panda library to read a CSV file. The data is in data1.csv. And then this next one is uh, a way of um, reading the tabular format of the data. And if this was just the entire table, this is a pretend one, but we have the um, seven rows and um, six columns. Um, then this is reading um, the Satosa rows, the Versicolor rows, and the Virginica rows in the appropriate format. So this explains it a little bit more. Um, so this is the data.lock is a dot lock accessor in pandas. Um, and the way you write it is there's a, a row index and a column index. Um, the NPR is the N NumPy function. Um, so that's why we call it. We have NumPy in addition to pandas. And it's a way of building arrays. Um, and it's looking at three slices of rows from 0, 0,3, 51 to 53 row, 101 to 103. And those indices mean that we can read from 0 to 2, 51 to 52, and 101 to 102. And then the colon is the, is the last column in the frame. And we can read all columns with that um, NumPy function. So that takes in all of our data. It's a nice, convenient way of getting it. The next part of the code, if you look at it, is a, a missing value check. And it's basically verifying the data set. And this is just good coding practice. So it looks at all of the columns that it just read in. And it checks to see if there's any missing data, any zeros in each column. And if, if there is something that is a null, um, it'll, it'll quit. If everything else is fine, if there's no nulls, it'll print data set is complete, no missing value. And so that's just a data verification. So we've got our data. We don't I don't mean to um, interrupt, but there's a couple folks who are having issues opening the data. I don't know if now is a good time to pause to make sure that everyone sure. can keep up or whether we should return to that later. Yeah, so they don't have to run the program. What I just want people to do is to um, look at the code. And what we're looking at is snippets of the code, sort of page by page, so that people can understand the code. Um, so they don't have to run it yet. We'll be using that in the exercise. So I just want people to be able to, to look at the code. And so I, th I think everyone was able to open the, the, the code. Is that correct? Like we had 13 say yes. Yeah, everyone was able to open the collab file, but there are some issues with with reading in data. But if we're going to do a more dedicated um, lab section, then yeah, that's fine. We can we can review this then. Yeah, so we won't stop. You know, you shouldn't be running your files yet. You should be trying to understand the code. Um, so sort of watch the slides now, I guess, or look at the slides in the code. So the, the next thing that you'll see in the code is creating your training and testing set. 
And so we could have done a two thirds, one third split, but we just cho chose to do a 70%, 30% split. Um, and we can also sort of do it through a threefold cost validation. But what we decide to do is that you know, 0.7, we know there's 150 flower data sets. And so we decide to, to um, choose the training data, which is 70% or 70% of 150, that's 105 flower data sets. And then the last set from uh, 106 to 150 is the um, um, testing data set. So we have a test set and a training set for this set. And this is what we partitioned. Now this is probably the most important image or description of what's going on. So we've got petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width. Um, we'll find that the one that has the, the lowest Gini index of all is petal length. But we'll see that there's um, you know, uh, no clear break between virginica and versicolor. We get sort of the cyan and green sort of merge together. There's a bias. But we can see that the setosa, which is red, splits out totally between from the versicolor virginica group. So the question is, what where is our split? Should we you know cut it three centimeters? Should we cut it two centimeters? Should we cut it 2.5, 2.6? And so this is the decision, the split decision we have to make. Now, you guys humans would say, oh, let's just choose two and a half. Um, but using the math, um, we would sort of test through all of the, the Gini calculations. And from here, we would see that uh, the maximum or minimum Gini value is reached at 2.45, not at 2.5, not at 2.4, not at 3. And so mathematically, the decision is that 2.45 is your best split. Um, and what happens is, is with this one, we reach a terminal node condition. Uh, if we split the setosas, they all fall off. They all have a petal length of less than 2.45 centimeters. So that's the terminal node. We don't have to do any more splitting. Uh, the Gini index for that is zero. And so that's also an indicator. But the Gini index um, at point uh, for the versicolor stuff in green um, in the virginica, it doesn't give us a zero index. It, it still leaves us with 74 flowers um, that are not fully classified. Um, you know, we could say, let's split it at four and a half, and we kind of get an okay split between Versicolor and Virginica, but we still have some overlap. So that node, which still has a mix of both Versicolor and Virginica, is called an impure node, whereas the one that has just the setosa is a terminal or pure node. And so we further we have to further split, um, maybe on sepal width or petal width, to get a better split between Versicolor and virginica. So to do splitting, we have to have a function that does testing, splitting, that looks for um, the rows of data given an index and a cutoff. So we're working with numerical values. So are we using petal width, petal length, sepal width, sepal length, and are we using you know, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, and so on. So we iterate through those different cutoffs and iterate the different features, sepal width, sepal length, petal width, petal width, those four different features, and the cutoffs, which range, I guess, we'll be using intervals of about 0.1 centimeter from maybe one centimeter to um, 15 centimeters. So this is what this function does. It, it iterates through uh, with the different lists. Also, we have to calculate the information gain or the Gini index. Uh, for these things. So for each of the splits, we have to be able to calculate um, the Gini. Um, and there's the Gini index. This function has spread over a couple of slides. Um, so we've got the in-classes, Versicolor, Virginica, Setosa, 
Um, we don't want to do any Gini index calculations on empty groups. That's just logic. Um, so we avoid dividing by zero. Here's where we calculate the Gini index. Remember, it's 1 minus the sum of p squareds. So you can see the 1 minus score or 1 minus p squared. And then we're also scaling by size and number of instances. Um, so it returns the Gini index for the different um, widths and for the different uh, flower measurements. Now that we've got the splitting function and we've got the Gini index calculation, then you can combine test split and Gini index um, calculation to do the best uh, selection or determining the optimal splits. So you're finding for each of the features, their minimum max values um, for sepal width and petal width and, uh, and their lengths. And then we're going to step through these measurements in 0.1 centimeter steps. And as we step through them, we're going to calculate the Gini index. And we want to see if as the Gini index starts dropping, 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 getting lower and lower, we say this is a better value, this is a better split. And then the Gini index will also start climbing. And so then we say this is not the best one. So we're trying to find a, a minimum. So it's, it's a bit of a search function as we step through all of the different ones. So it's, it's essentially performing a grid search. And then when, once we've decided, as we did with the, I think it was the petal width, the 2.45 centimeter cutoff, we reached a terminal node because we found that there was a pure node. And then now we want to see if we can create other pure nodes or terminal nodes. So um, we can have a, either a decided maximum depth um, for the node, or if we reach terminal nodes, then the tree just stops growing. Um, and that will provide the final class. Uh, we can obviously have situations where, you know, maybe we don't find any combination of petal width and length and sepal width and length that really works. Um, and so um, those will be, those predictions will be based on the most common class. So, you know, we got 90% of them right, but not all of them work. So the recursive splitting is the one that, that goes through all of these things. It's um, going back and forth to make sure that we, if, we've, if we haven't reached a terminal node, we go back and look at the impure node, split again, chest a feature, test its um, information gain or genie index, and keep on going until we get this terminal node. And we're working on left-right nodes, because if you split, you've got something that goes to the right, something goes to the left. And so we're using the term left-right. Um, and um, if a terminal node is created, if either the left or right child node is empty of data, or the maximum depth is reached. So there's uh, the code itself is sort of spread over a couple of um, pages. And so the explanations I've given here are just sort of to better define what's what's being done. Uh, if we've got a, an empty group check, we also see if there's a maximum depth that's reached. If the current depth is the maximum, then we create terminal nodes and just stop splitting. If we haven't reached the maximum depth, then we force the left child node to become a terminal node if it contains too few samples, or we just keep on splitting. And the last part is, um, to work both with the left one and then to do the ones on the right side. And once maximum depth is reached or no left or right child contain no data, then we're done. So the, the decision tree has been completed or completely built. So that's the decision tree. And so the last step is to say, okay, if we built the decision tree, now can we take new data or existing data and run it through and perform the classification. Um, so this is making the prediction. If, if I give you a flower that I've just plucked from my garden and I've measured the sepal width and length and the petal width and length, is it versicolor? Is it setosa? Is it virginica? 
So this is the code that, that performs that, that prediction. So you guys have access to the full length code. Um, we spread it out over a bunch of slides. So it's 123 lines. We have comments. Um, if you train it on the set of 150, the training and finding the, the rules, which pedal width and sepal length is best, it'll take about a second, second and a half. Uh, and then if you want to run the whole thing, uh, where you give it some new data, it'll take about two, two and a half seconds. So what we did is we, we wrote the program, but then we also then had to test it um, on the training set. So it's training on 70% or 105 entries. And on the training set, we found that it was able to get um, perfect performance. So this is the confusion matrix. So did the predicted cytosis match with the observed ones? Yes, 100%. Virginica? Yes. Versicolor? Yes. Were there any false positives or false negatives? No. So the confusion matrix has this perfect diagonal. And uh, the classification for the training set is perfect. So then we can take the next 45 set of flowers, which is our holdout set, and they included some Setosa, Virginica, and Versicolor. And then we can ask, how well does the program do? And this is the validation. So just to remind everyone, we chose our problem, we got our data set, we selected the features, did the data transformation, we chose a decision tree, we trained it on 105, we got almost perfect performance, we optimized the splitting function and the key numbers, and then we can validate it. And so when we validate it on the 45 holdout, we're perfect on Setosa, perfect on Virginica, but not quite perfect on Versicolor. So the Versicolor gets confused with some Virginica. Um, but it's still, you know, almost perfect. And, and so this is where you can say, I've tested it on the training set, and then I've tested it on the holdout or validation or testing data set. And the fact that the confusion matrix on the testing set or validation set is almost identical to the training one is a good sign. This is just comparing the two. Normally in machine learning, if you're doing some kind of categorical or even numeric evaluation, you want the performance of your training and testing sets to be within about 5% of each other. If you're seeing a difference that's, that's much greater than that, like your training gets you 99% correct and your test set gets you 65% correct, that's a problem. That means you've overtrained. And I see this so often in machine learning where people will you know, run their, their test and they'll say, yeah, I got 100% or 99% on my training data. But when I test it on something else, I only get 65 What's my performance? Well, your performance is the performance on your testing set, um, not on your training set. And what's more, um, it's likely that if you tried it on any other holdout data set, the performance would drop even further. So when you see a significant drop from your test or your training to your test set, or from your test to your validation, or from your training to your validation, that's a red flag that says you're overtraining or have overtrained. In this case, we're within that sort of five, five and a half, ten percent uh, range. And so this one is not overtrained. This is a perfectly reasonable result. So at this stage, you've got your model trained, you've validated it, you've obviously tested it when you trained it, but you've validated it with a, a separate test set. You could have another holdout. You could have also done threefold cost validation if you wanted. Um, but all said and done, um, the model that we have now um, is ready to make predictions. Um, so we trained it on a training set of 105. We tested it on a set of 45. The generic code um, is actually very, very useful for um, any kind of classification 
problem. So we could use it not only to classify flowers, we could also use it to classify patients, cases, and controls. We could use levels of gene expression, protein expression, metabolite expression, because we've designed a generic system that takes in numbers. Um, it doesn't have to be flower dimensions. It could be you know, the abundance of a gene or transcript. So at this stage, what I want people to do is to um, now go to the lab. This is where you can actually explore the code and run it on a few examples. Now, if some people really want to work in R, maybe this is an opportunity where we can find out if someone really wants to do R or if everyone is happy with Python. Because as I said, we're teaching everything in Python, but if you're um, totally uncomfortable with Python, uh, we have this option where you can run R. So I don't know if Nia or uh, can do a poll, find out if everyone's ready and willing to work with Python or if one or two people or a large group need to work with R.